Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh. Oh. The chamber. Uh, we, we don't have. I thought you were going to bring to my attention some of the language of, uh, uh, being used, but uh, there being no quorum present, ring the bells. Um, there's a formal process to interact across the chamber. Um, some, some discretion has been granted from the chair. I urge both Senators Bragg and Senator Stirl to cease and desist. Senator Bragg and Senator Stirl. Thank you. You didn't even count to ten. Either of you didn't count to ten. Senator Stirl and Senator Bragg. Senator Stirl and Bragg, really? Come on, it's Wednesday night. Let's. We can both. Quorum present. Quorum present. I call Senator Scar. Oh, sorry, Senator Watt. My apologies. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, is there anything that the Liberal and National parties hate more than superannuation? It really is hard to think of anything that Liberal Party and National Party members of Parliament and senators hate more than superannuation. And why? because that superannuation is about looking after workers. And that's what the Liberal and National Party have against superannuation. They don't want average workers to benefit from the kind of retirement that all of them will enjoy for the rest of their lives, especially those who, as Senator Stirl was talking about, were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They're all fine, but average workers, no, they can't have a dignified retirement. They can't live comfortably in their retirement. They should go back to the old system before superannuation was invented by Labor and have to struggle through poverty in their retirement. That's what the Liberals and the Nationals want for workers. And If you need any proof of that, just look, have a look at the history of superannuation in this country. When Labor created superannuation, the Liberals and the Nationals opposed it. And pretty much every year since, they've launched attack after attack on our superannuation system, which is designed to give working people in this country a dignified retirement. Every time it's been legislated to increase, the Liberals and the Nationals come after it. And we've seen that debate play out over the last 12, 12 months or so with all these Liberal backbenchers saying that we shouldn't have an increase in super, inventing ways for superannuation to be raided, and it's all because they want to launch attack after attack on superannuation. And that's exactly what's happening in this set of bills that we're debating at short notice tonight. There's just the latest salvo in the ongoing war of the Liberal Party and National Party against superannuation and against working people in this country. But in my remarks tonight, I particularly want to focus on the efforts of someone else in this parliament, someone else, in fact, in this chamber, someone else who has become known around Queensland as the LNP's best friend in Canberra. And I'm talking about, of course, Senator Pauline Hanson. And Senator Hanson, I hope you're watching what I've got to say, because you're going to be called out once and for all for the selfish fraud whose snout is in the trough that you are and you have always been. 
Of course, the Liberals defending Senator Hanson. What else would we expect? What's the point of order? Sorry, point of order. Senator Scar. Of order, uh, Acting Deputy President. There were gross personal reflections uh, just made against Senator Hanson, my, uh, my fellow senator from Queensland, and I think they should be withdrawn. I didn't hear it, and I don't think the president heard it either. But if there were, um, then the person who was offending should withdraw. I'm not surprised that a Liberal senator wants to defend Senator Hanson because we know there's a, an alliance between the parties. But I, if I have caused offence, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Watt. That Thank was you. the right thing to do. Thank now, you, Madam Deputy. Continue. Acting Deputy President. So, as I say, in my remaining remarks, I want to focus on what Senator Hanson is up to in this debate and in this bill. And let's remember that it was Senator Hanson who provided the votes only an hour or two ago to this government to rush this legislation through to make sure that we would deal with it tonight when the program didn't have that happen. So why is Senator Hanson in such a rush to get this legislation dealt with, that it has to be dealt with in a late night sitting of the Senate tonight? What, what on earth could Senator Hanson be so interested in about this legislation? Well, let's have a look. What we are seeing here by Senator Hanson uh, through this debate and through an amendment that she is moving is probably the biggest personal rort I have ever seen in federal politics. That's what we are seeing in this legislation and in the amendment that Senator Hanson is moving. Now, a lot of people haven't noticed this yet because it was just snuck in late today. But Senator Hanson, on behalf of Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, is moving Amendment 8983. Now, you've actually got to understand a little bit, of super, a, a bit, little bit about superannuation to understand exactly what Senator Hanson is trying to do with this amendment, because it's all worded in very technical language about concessional contributions caps and dollar figures and years and things like that. But let's be very clear about what Senator Hanson is trying to do by moving this amendment right here. What Senator Hanson is trying to do by moving this amendment is to give herself a $30,000 pay rise over the next six years that she hopes to be in this parliament. That's right. $30,000 will go to Senator Hanson if this amendment that she has moved gets through. Now, why, why does it only affect Senator Hanson? Because she has drafted this in a way that only benefits her and a very small number of other people in this chamber, or in fact, in this country. Because what this amendment will do will basically change the concessional rate of superannuation only for high income earners, only for people who earn roughly $250,000 a year or thereabouts. Now, what kind of people in this country earn $250,000 a year or so? Oh, it might be senators. We happen to be very well paid people, um, and Senator Hanson is one of those people. So, this won't be benefiting a single battler in Queensland who she says, the fraud that she is, that she's in Canberra to defend. It won't benefit anyone in Mundumbra. It won't benefit anyone in Gainda. It won't benefit anyone in either. Vold. It won't benefit anyone outside Toowoomba or anywhere else in regional Queensland that is struggling to get ahead with no wage rises year after year. Oh, but my golly, it's going to benefit Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson is going to get a $30,000 pay rise as a result of an amendment that she is moving. She has put this to the government. This isn't some government engineered plan. This is something that has Senator Hanson's name on it because she wants the $30,000 pay rise. Now, as I say, the way it's going to be done is by changing the superannuation concessional contributions regime only in a way that benefits high income earners. So she's got herself in there in the first instance by being a high income earner, but it gets better. It gets better. This benefit, this pay rise, will only be given to people who are aged 67 or over. Now, why would you pick that year? Why, why would it be 67 and not 66, not 65, not 64, not 69, not 70, not 71? Why would it be 67? Well, who, who knew? How old is Senator Hanson? She's 67! How about that? So Senator Hanson is moving an amendment to give high-income earners like her a $30,000 pay rise over the six-year term that she would serve in this parliament, but only only if they're 67. 
Now, I might look pretty old, but I'm not 67. There's not many people in here who are 67, but Senator Hanson is 67. And the beauty of this amendment that she's trying to move is that she won't only get a pay rise one year, she'll get it the next year, and the one after that, and the one after that, and the one after that. In the first year, she'll get a $1,500 pay rise. In the second year, a $3,000 pay rise. Third year, four and a half thousand. Fourth year, six thousand. Fifth year, seven and a half thousand. And again, seven and a half thousand in year six. All up over six years, Senator Hanson stands to gain a thirty thousand dollar pay rise that won't apply to anyone who's under sixty-seven. But it just so happens that people who are sixty-seven or older, maybe like Senator Hanson, get a thirty thousand dollar pay rise. Now, I don't know about Senator Polly. I don't know about Senator Stirl. I don't know about Senator Urquhart. And to be fair, I don't know about members in the Liberal Party in the National Party. But I did not get elected to come down and serve the battlers of Queensland by giving myself a pay rise. But it is very clear that that is why Senator Hanson is here. I've had a gutful of Senator Hanson running around central Queensland, running around regional Queensland, saying that she's for the battlers and coming down here time after time after time, voting against battlers, voting to make it harder for coal miners who are working as labour hire as casuals, and now giving herself a nice $30,000 pay rise. That's not why I got elected. That's not why any Labor senator got elected. And I doubt that's why many people from other parties got elected. But it is certainly why Senator Hanson got, got herself elected. People have known for a long time that when Senator Hanson says that she comes to Canberra to help battlers, what she really means is that she comes here to help herself. We have seen over the years, and this goes back into her days well before I was in this chamber, Senator Hanson uh, invented and got the practice of rorting electoral funds down to an art form. Well, now what she's doing with this amendment is trying to rort taxpayers' funds for her own personal benefit to give her a pay rise. It is a disgrace. Senator Hanson should be ashamed of what she is doing. Senator Hanson should apologise to every single battler in Queensland who she has tricked into thinking that she's here for them when she's actually here to give herself a nice big pay rise. No other member of this chamber would treat battlers or Australians with, with such contempt, but Senator Hanson has finally been caught out doing what many of us have known that she's been about for a very long time. And the worst part about this is that this is all part of a dodgy deal that Senator Hanson has done with the government to get this legislation through. Senator Hanson, as I say, is the LNP's best friend here in Canberra. She lines up with them time and time again. They can always count on her vote, no matter what they want to do, whether they're coming after pensioners, whether they're coming after workers, whether they're coming after penalty rates, and now to actually give herself another big pay rise. Yet another dodgy deal between the LNP and Pauline Hanson to rush legislation through and this time to give Pauline Hanson a personal pay rise rise of $30,000. It is a disgrace. Senator Hanson should be ashamed of herself. Senator Roberts should be ashamed of himself. And If any government senator votes with Senator Hanson on this amendment, they should be ashamed of themselves as well. And they, Those of us from Queensland should go back home and justify what, to Queensland battlers why you're voting to give Senator Pauline Hanson a $30,000 pay rise. It is a disgrace. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Scar. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I'm pleased to speak uh, in favour of the bills before us tonight. Now, senators in this place, Madam Acting Deputy President, will know, or should know by now, after my having served in this place for two years, that I do not adopt a doctrinaire or ideological approach to the concept of superannuation. Far from it. Absolutely not. Every Australian worker in this country should expect should expect in a country as wealthy as ours to enjoy a comfortable retirement, every single one of them. Personally, I'm actually a member of an industry super fund, Australian Super. I'm a very happy member of Australian Super. They've given me um, a very good return over a number of years, and I think Ian Silk and his team, they've done a great job, absolutely. I have absolutely no ideological conflict in relation to the concept of superannuation. Every single worker in this country, in a country as wealthy as ours, has a reasonable expectation or should have a reasonable expectation for a comfortable retirement. Every single Australian worker. And that's important. That's an important equity for this country. Absolutely. So having said that, I want to take three points, three points in relation to this legislation. 
Senator McKim, and I always listen very carefully to Senator McKim when he speaks, and he spoke about the issue of ethical investment funds as opposed to other investment funds. The reality is, and I expect that Senator McKim is aware of this, that quite often ethical investment funds actually outperform other investment funds. Exactly, Senator McKim. Exactly. You are aware of it. I thought you would be. Hence, the best financial interest test should have nothing, should have nothing, should, should instill no fear whatsoever in terms of investors who want to invest in ethical investment funds. In fact, in fact, perhaps the converse is true. Perhaps the converse is true, Senator McKim. Perhaps the converse is true. Perhaps the converse is true. And just in relation to that, I want to quote some research which Morningstar, a very reputable uh, organisation, conducted, which was reported in that uh, extreme right-wing newspaper called The Guardian. That's sarcasm for the, uh, for the Hansard record, Madam Acting Deputy President, The Guardian, under a, uh, under a heading which was ethical, and I quote, ethical investments are outperforming traditional funds, end quote. Ethical investments are outperforming traditional funds. And Morningstar compared 745 ethical investment funds against 4,150 traditional funds. And they found, and I quote, over 10 years, the average return for a sustainable fund invested in large global companies has been 6.9 per cent a year, while a traditionally invested fund has made 6.3 per cent a year." End quote. So that's what the evidence suggests. So that's what the evidence suggests. So as opposed to the rhetoric, when we look at the evidence, those Australians who, as a matter of principle, but also as a matter of prudent investment, want to invest in ethical investment funds have nothing to fear whatsoever from the introduction of a best financial interest test. Absolutely nothing to fear whatsoever. There is nothing controversial about it. The second point I want to make is in relation to this concept of a single default fund. And, uh, Senator McKim again made a very good point that many Australians do not spend a lot of time reflecting on their superannuation. And too many Australians in this country have too many funds. So instead of having one, instead of having one superannuation fund, one superannuation account in order to minimise the fees and charges, they have multiple. And many times they're not even aware of the multiple funds they have. And many times those workers who have those multiple funds, many times those workers who have multiple funds are our most vulnerable workers. They're in transient employment. They're not long-term employees of a single employer. So we need to do everything we possibly can. We need to do everything we possibly can to promote the motion, to promote the notion that the most prudent and efficient retirement strategy is to have one superannuation fund to minimise the fees and charges which are taken from the fund. And the scheme which is established through this legislation, again, it is hardly controversial that Unless you exercise your choice as an employee, your one default fund follows you from job to job. If you choose to change, if you choose to change your superannuation fund, then that's your right. You can change your superannuation fund. Entirely reasonable, entirely reasonable, and hardly an ideological argument. And then the third point is underperformance. And the reality is, the reality is that the evidence is indisputable that there are a number of underperforming funds. And as Senator McKim said, too many Australians don't, aren't focused on the performance of their superannuation funds. Perhaps over the last 18 months or so they've been more focused on it. Perhaps over the last 18 months. But we need to do something to protect workers. We need to do something to protect all Australians whose retirement is going to be materially impacted if they are participating in underperforming superannuation funds. And that's the third pillar, the third pillar of the reforms introduced by this legislation. So in summary, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I am no ideologue, absolutely no ideologue in relation to superannuation. I want every single Australian, every single Australian to have the opportunity to retire in comfort. There are lots of great people from both the employer side and the employee side involved in industry superannuation funds. I think we can make the system better. 
I think we can make the system better so it works better for workers, it works better for all Australians, and we can provide a better retirement for Australians who work so hard during the course of their lives. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on Treasury Law's amendment, Your Future, Your Super Bill 2021. Australia's income retirement system is the envy of the rest of the world as a great legacy of the Keating government. Compulsory superannuation has seen a $3 trillion nest egg grow. These savings provide a boost to our national economy. They can go into infrastructure investment, which can go into strengthening our national sovereignty. That is something that should be applauded and celebrated by those opposite. But instead of that, we have this ill-conceived legislation that is before the Senate. And we know that the dirty deal was done today. And we heard from Senator Watt that the vested interest of Senator Hanson has been on full display. So I can't wait to hear her contribution. The Liberals have never believed in universal super. They opposed it at the beginning and they continue to undermine it each and every chance that they get. This bill implements the government's 2021 budget measure, Your Future, Your Super. The government claims these measures will enhance the performance of superannuation funds and reduce the amount of duplicate accounts in the system. We welcome the government's late commitment to action on serious issues such as multiple accounts and underperforming superannuation funds. However, this bill, as written, will not deliver better outcomes for Australian superannuation members. The evidence provided to the inquiry of this legislation makes it clear that the government's proposed approach to superannuation would damage retirement outcomes for ordinary Australians and subject to our superannuation system to considerable risk. They may have removed some elements of this bill, but we still cannot accept this legislation. The first schedule introduced a new system for stapling individual members to a single superannuation account, replacing the existing industrial determined superannuation default account system for any member who has a previous existing super account. The retail super funds are happy with this bill as they usually get people first when they're 16 at their first jobs. However, this could have unwarranted consequences. It could staple members to an underperforming fund or it would mean that some employees would not receive insurance appropriate to their profession. The second element of this bill introduces a new measure that will assess the performance of certain superannuation funds against benchmarks determined by the regulations and prevent funds that fail to meet those benchmarks from accepting new members. Labor strongly supports the implementation of a performance measure. However, the proposed measure in Schedule 2 are significantly flawed. Some stakeholders have indicated that the government's proposed performance measures could reward underperforming funds, incentivise funds to increase administration fees or drive investment away from Australians' unlisted assets. The bill also ignores admin fees in the performance benchmarks. It just ignores them. It gives a green light to bad funds to increase their administration charges at the expense of members' accumulation. The government's proposed benchmarks for this for its performance measures may actively penalise funds for investing in unlisted Australian assets such as venture capital, private equity or infrastructure assets. These index will risk local investment. Now, I can't emphasise that enough. This bill will put at risk local investment and with it local jobs and wages. So not only are they not doing anything in this bill that is really going to be beneficial for ordinary Australians, but they are in fact putting at risk local investment, local jobs and wages. Does that sound familiar? 
I think it does to Senator Urquhart and Senator Brown because it's in the Liberals' DNA. Whenever they can have a go at superannuation, that's where they'll be, first in line to have a go. If there's an opportunity to have a go at ordinary workers, this government again will be first in line. Now, research from the Connex Institute demonstrates that if trustees of super funds design portfolios to explicitly account for your future, your super performance tests, many funds would need to significantly alter their investment strategy. The results of this research highlight the conflict trustees will face between managing for best member outcomes and prioritising the your future, your super performance test. David Bell, executive director of the Connex Institute, has claimed that, and I quote, if trustees continue with their current investment strategy, they expose themselves to a reasonable likelihood of failing, failing the performance test at some point, simply through the short-term randomness of returns. He also went on to say that, and I quote, these trustees would also face the prospect of having to modify their investment strategy in response to short-term performance, creating transactional costs while inadvertently reducing their ability to invest for the long term, end the quote. As I said earlier, we do support performance measures, but while the performance mechanisms proposed in Schedule 2 will prevent new members from joining underperforming funds, it does nothing to assist members already in underperforming funds. Pretty important, I would have thought, to protect those people as well. According to Treasury, this affects up to 3 million Australians and the potential cost Australians tens of thousands of dollars in retirement savings. So they're putting at risk local investment, local jobs, local wages for Australian workers, and the potential is that it could cost Australian workers tens of thousands of dollars in retirement savings. The third measure introduces the requirement that super fund trustees must act in the best financial interests of members, as opposed to the current requirement that merely asking that they act in the best interest of members. Labor thinks superannuation trustees must also act in the best interests of their members, not those of apparent entities. We are glad that the government removed the regulatory kill switch from the bill but there is still significant government overreach in the form of consequences for performance tests. The measures proposed by the Morrison government are seriously flawed, and much of the detail has been left to regulations, which is becoming a habit of this government. And I know that Senator Carr, myself and others have spoken about that numerous times in this chamber. This government is prone to leaving everything to regulation. Now, by the way, regulations which have not been finalised, I might add, have not been set. Who knows what's actually going to be included? And that is always why you need to always read the fine print or look into what isn't in the bill because this government cannot be trusted when it comes to superannuation and protecting Australian workers. They are also limited coverage of measures. The performance measures proposed do not extend to all choice products and will initially only cover my super products. The vast majority of underperforming funds are concentrated in the choice sector. The government's bill will take effect from 1 July 2021, requiring Australian employers to scramble to implement the new system in less than a month. That is why Labor will be moving a series of amendments to fix the bill. We are not here to sink it, we're here to fix it, which is what we find we have to do on countless pieces of legislation, but this is critical legislation and it must be fixed. 
But if the government can't accept these simple fixes, we'll protect the interests of Australian workers by voting this poorly drafted bill down. It is abundantly clear that the Liberals cannot be trusted with superannuation. They wanted to allow Australians to have early access to their super accounts so they could buy a house. A nonsensical idea as the supply of housing is relatively inelastic, meaning if you increase the demand for housing by allowing people early access to super, it will only drive up the cost. We must address the housing affordability crisis in Australia, but it must be done by addressing supply-side shortages. This is just basic economics 101. Those opposite also allowed Australians to raid their super funds during the pandemic instead of giving them timely access to support. This meant that people were robbing their own futures. They were robbing their own futures when we should be encouraging people to put more money into their superannuation. We now have 600,000 people who will be left with zero, zero in their superannuation fund account because the government refused to provide them with other support. People in casual work, and in particular young people, were encouraged to take money out of their superannuation because of the compound interest it will have a large negative impact on their retirement income. Not only this, it will also make a significant difference to our national economy, placing a greater burden on future budgets. It will also add to that the rates of people accessing their super was twice what was predicted. It calls to question, was this responsible policy? Did anyone access their super who didn't need to, or were they not properly informed of the consequences of early withdrawal? Very basic questions that I don't believe were put to people. Wages have effectively been frozen for eight years under the Liberal governments, and as was revealed in the budget, over the next four years they're going to go down. Yet, what is their argument about superannuation and wages? The Liberals seem to have no problem suppressing our economy with their own inaction. During the last eight years, we have had stagnant wages, and at the same time, those opposite have held off and broken commitments they took to the 2013 and 2016 and then the 2019 election that they would not freeze super. We are now on the eve of the next federal election, but we know that they are opposed to the increase of superannuation up to 12 per cent, a measure which would place less of a burden on future taxpayers to fund Australians in retirement. But let's be realistic. The Morrison government, this Liberal government, is not interested in improving outcomes for Australian superannuation members. They are interested only in their own political advancement at the cost of the national economy. We know the Prime Minister is only interested in one job, and that's his own job. He reinforces that day in, day out with his broken promises and his loose with the truth comments that he makes and commitments that he gives to the Australian people. Superannuation was delivered by the Keating government, by the Labor government, to give ordinary Australians the benefit of professional management of their money. It's important to ensure quality of life in retirement, to support the national economy into the future. And it is a legacy that I am very proud of. I am very proud of and a great defender of superannuation. And we already know that women in this country will not retire on the same money as our male colleagues. They're not going to have the same retirement. We will always speak up and we will always work for a better, a decent retirement for all Australians. We will fight tooth and nail because it's in the best interests of all Australians to have a dignified retirement where they will no longer have to rely on future budgets and future taxpayers to fund 
uh, pensions going forward. So this government, instead of doing, making changes that was going to be beneficial and encouraging people to put more money in their super, once again, it's in their DNA. They're out to attack superannuation and Thank ordinary, you, everyday Polly. Australian workers. Senator, Cal uh, Senator Burkett. To your attention, the state of the chamber, ah. Madam Deputy President. Quorum yes. required. Yes. Ring the bells. I was going to say Senator Canavan, not quite in the style of Senator Alston, but uh, for those of us old enough to remember. <laughs> Quorum present, Senator Carol Brown. Deputy Acting President, um, I rise to make a contribution this evening on the um, cognate debate, but I specifically would like to make uh, my remarks on the Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Future, Your Super Bill 2020. As everyone in the parliament would know and uh, in the community throughout communities throughout Australia, Labor built the superannuation system in this country. It is a proud legacy of Labor. It is a system which seeks to ensure that hard-working Australians can have a decent retirement but also provides a huge national saving pool that, that can be reinvested in our economy to provide jobs and incomes to workers today. It's a system which does need constant improvement to maximise returns for workers, the fund contributors. One obvious improvement would be to increase the superannuation guarantee over time and as originally intended. However, Sadly, as we are all acutely aware in this place, it is successive Liberal governments that have sought to stymie this long overdue increase. First, the Howard government, then the Abbott government, then the Turnbull government, and now the Morrison government. Because every time the Liberals try to tinker with the superannuation system in this country, they seek to do so not to improve outcomes for workers, 
not in the best interests of working people, their jobs and their life after paid work, but rather with vested interests at heart and ultimately their proposed solutions lead to worse retirement outcomes for workers. Because when reasonable suggestions are put forward to fix clearly inherent flaws in their legislation, they reject them. They reject them. This is what we are seeing here yet again this evening. It is the Liberal Party returning to type, true to form, going after the hip pockets of working people, undermining the strength of the superannuation system set up to provide for workers' retirement. And it is clear that this bill and these bills in the cognate debate that we're having here today, but specifically this bill, your future, your super bill 2020, has many flaws. Many of these problems were identified through the inquiry into the bill by the Senate Standing Committee on Economics. In a dissenting report on the bill, Labor senators outlined in detail the reservations we have on this side of the chamber have with, these, with this bill. There are a great many flaws in this legislation, many of them with the potential to cause significant harm, harm in a broader sense to the Australian economy, and more specifically harm to superannuation fund members right across Australia. And put simply, that means harm to working people and their families. That is why Labor cannot support the bill in its current form. We put this forward. We have put forward in good faith to the government that they need to review and reconsider the issues that have been raised directly with them and canvassed through the Senate Standing Committee on, Eco on Economics. In the, in the inquiry on the bill, so that the bill can be improved and actually deliver on, on the stated intent. Deliver on the stated intent. Only after the legislation has been revised, amended, should the bill be returned to Parliament. In its current form, it simply is not good enough. Let's consider some of the serious flaws that were identified through the inquiry process. Firstly, there is the political override power. This bill includes an extraordinary power that would allow the Treasurer to personally override any investment decision or payment decision made by a superannuation trustee. Why? How could this possibly be necessary? It is an absolute overreach. It clearly goes too far and it must be reconsidered or knocked out in this place. Now let's come to the provisions on stapling to underperforming funds. The implementation of the stapling mechanism would cause up to 3 million Australians to be stapled to unperforming funds. How can that be good for workers or fund contributors? Now we have heard uh, in terms of stapling, um, that the, under the Your Future, Your Super, according to APRA, contains, also contains many occupational e exclusion. And, and this is a really important point um, because some of the most hazardous um, jobs are excluded from insurance coverage from particular superannuation funds. So I just want to go through some of the occupations that we're talking about, some of the most hazardous occupations that need coverage that are excluded by some funds, which goes to the point that people need to be very careful about the fund that they join. 
and this is and that goes again to this stapling to un performing funds and the fact that according to APRA 3 million Australians will be stapled to un unperforming funds so we go to some of those commonly excluded occupations include boilermakers bricklayers carpenters concreters dogmen fitter and turners labourers painters plasterers plumber plumbers electricians, riggers, scaffolding and welder, welders. Now, people may not be aware, those that are signed to these uh, super funds, that AMP, for example, exclude, have specific exclusions. And at AMP, bricklayers, concreters, dogmen, labourers, plasterers, plumbers who work on roofs, electrician, electric um, linesmen, riggers and scaffolders cannot get total and permanent disability covers. They're totally excluded. Totally excluded. At MLC, t uh, the total and um, permanent disability cover completely excludes farm labourers and railway workers. That is, that is, that they're excluded. So if you don't know that th you're excluded, by stapling a worker who's new to a hazarded occupation to one of these funds, and there are others, I have to say, there are others, you will see a member paying premiums for no cover, a fee for no service, if you like. And we all know in this place that the, um, the most serious uh, hazardous um, occupations are around the building industry. So we have around uh, 2.7 million people that work in the risky, riskiest quintile of Australian occupations, which include many of those that I've already spoken about and miners and, as well. And there are 34, over 34,000 new entries into the construction workforce annually, and many start out as, a, as apprentices and often well below the age of 25. And so insurance is especially impor important for young people, blue collar building and construction workers, as they're more than likely, twice as likely to um, than the general popu population at the same age, um, that, that will require insurance. So today, only seven funds nationwide continue to offer um, default opt-out cover to under 25s. The government forced the rest to switch it off in 2020. That's what this government did, switch it off in 2020. That means that a hazardous occupation apprentice or young worker will not get de default cover at, other, at particular funds. So this is a very important part of this legislation and it, it's, it's going, it goes too far. And it needs to clearly be reconsidered. So, as I was saying, the implementation of the stapling me mechanism would cause up to three million Australians to be stapled to unperforming funds, and we all know, quite frankly, that that cannot be um, good f for workers or their funds. It can't. Put simply, up to three million Australians will be left worse off in retirement because of this provision. The whole point of making changes to super should be to improve the retirement incomes of workers, not worsen them. And what about the impact on insurance? Australian workers in certain industries will be left without adequate insurance, as I've already mentioned, as a result of this bill, and leaving working people with less than adequate insurance coverage. Hardly sounds like an item on the tick list for a government that was genuine about, if they were genuine about improving the way superannuation works for uh, works for workers. And what about the bill's failure to cover all APRA, APRA regulated funds? This bill explicitly excludes up to one third of all superannuation funds regulated by APRA from performance from the performance measure. We know that performance measure is critical to ensuring that funds always seek to get the best possible returns in their members' interest, why should certain funds be excluded from this critical feature? Which brings us to the flawed performance measure. Stakeholders have identified numerous flaws 
in the performance benchmarks originally proposed by this by the government, including the exclusion of administrative fees and the potential to discourage investment in Australian assets. There is no reason to exclude these basic fees, and I would have thought the very last thing the government should be seeking to do is discouraging reinvestment in our own Australian assets. Investment by funds here at home, notably, has added the benefit of growing our local economy and providing more jobs in our local communities. And what about the administrative burden on funds included within this bill? The drafting of the proposed best financial interest duty provisions could place undue administrative costs on superannuation funds, which will be passed on to members in the form of higher costs. Well, that's a big cross. Higher costs to members equal, equals lower returns on investment. Wrong way. Go back. Redraft. Oh, but no, not, not this government. And of course, there's the administrative burden on employers again, which is proposed by the start date of this bill, the 1st of July, could have significant impacts on employers who will be required to implement changes to payroll processes in an extremely short period of time. Another flaw which could be easily fixed. And of course, the issues identified by Labor senators in the dissenting report are not only issues identified by stakeholders in relation to the bill. Many of these issues have been identified in Chapter 2 of the Chair's report on the bill. Or on the it is for these reasons and more that Labor believes this bill is in need of a serious rewrite. Improving superannuation for fund members is the objective of the bill. So I'll just say that again. Improving superannuation outcomes for fund members is the objective of the bill. And Labor supports that objective. We always have and always will. But we cannot support a bill which fundamentally and manifestly fails, fails to deliver on that objective, not without needed improvements to address these serious concerns. So I just want to say again that Labor supports in any move to improve superannuation outcomes for fund members, as is the stated objective of this bill. Which is, as I've said, Madam De Acting Deputy President, is what we always have done. But of course, we, this bill does not do that. It doesn't deliver on that objective. Not without serious improvements to, to address these serious issues that have been thank raised you, by Labor. Senator, Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. We just want to take point, first of all, uh, with some comments that were passed by Senator Bragg. Isn't it amazing that he had the hide to turn around and stand here in this parliament and have a go at the banks? He said the banks are part of the problem, except there's a bill that doesn't deal with the retail banks. He says the banks need to be held to account, but this bill doesn't make them accountable. In actual fact, it clearly makes them unaccountable. Now, I'll describe Senator Bragg as a modern liberal defender and protector of all things commercial. Of course, unless it involves content agreement disagreements with people like the ABC, he disagrees with them. He disagrees with actually making sure retail super funds are held to account. Of course, for those things, all things commercial, whilst he's running the defence line for the retail funds. Senator Bragg, let's look at his track record. He happily delivered the keynote speech of the 2020 FinTech Awards, where the top gong was given to a payday lender before pay. That charges only 5 per cent to lend up to $200 for a week, the equivalent of a 260 per cent annual interest rate. Well, it says it all, doesn't it? And of course, Senator Bragg touched on the important area of the reverse onus of proof. 
Now, we don't have to go into all the legal details of reverse onus of proof, except to simply say that the only other people in the inquiry that we carried into this, um, into your future, your super, the Senate inquiry, that what was highlighted by the departments, that the only significant other areas where there's reverse onus of proof, other than on superannuation funds that are not run for profit, are Australian pedophiles accused of being pedophiles overseas. They have a reverse onus of proof. Terrorists have a reverse onus of proof. So now we've got industry funds that have some of the most prominent businesses, employer organisations in the country, and heaven forbid, worker representatives on those equal numbers on the board, all now have a reverse onus of proof, just like pedophiles and just like terrorists. Now, doesn't that say it all about Senator Bragg highlighting that point? Now, the Morrison government has landed on a strategy for how it can attempt to pass woeful legislation through this parliament. The government serves up an abysmal bill, is opposed by all corners of the Australian parliament, even by members of the Prime Minister's own coalition. The government is then forced to act some of the most offensive parts of its bill, and then the Prime Minister sees if it can squeeze through the unpalatable leftovers. The Morrison government tried to exclude administration fees from performance testing, and the Prime Minister was forced to backflip. The Morrison government served up benchmarking, which would have disincentivised investment in regional Australia, and the Prime Minister was forced to backflip. And the Morrison government attempted to give the Treasurer the power to cancel any investment by any super fund for any reason, and the Prime Minister was forced to backflip. Now, I wish I could say that this means the bill before us now is a sensible piece of legislation which addresses the actual issues in the superannuation sector, but it's not. First and foremost, this bill still contains a backdoor for the Treasurer of the day to create regulation to control what super funds can and can't invest in. They might be able to dupe the National Party, but they can't certainly dupe us. The power was supposed to have been removed from this bill in the House, but if you read the fine print of the bill on page 30, Schedule 3, Part 1, Section 10, it's all too clear. You'll see that super fund trustees will be forced to comply with any requirements prescribed by the regulation. This is a limitless power for the current Treasurer and any future Treasurer to take direct control over super fund investments. Now, I'll come back to the sneaky attempt to backdoor these powers a little bit later. I just want to go to the Productivity Commission 2018 inquiry into superannuation found that two issues, unintended multiple counts and entrenched underperformers are costing Australians $3.8 billion each year. Well, Labor wants to address these problems. Industry super funds want to address these problems. Employers want to address these problems. Judging by this bill, the Morrison government doesn't. This is a bill with a very small constituency, but a constituency that is very important to this Prime Minister. And that's the constituency, of course, of the big banks. The Prime Minister, who voted against a Royal Commission in banks on 26 separate occasions. The Prime Minister, who as Treasurer referred to Labor's calls for Royal Commission into banks as a populist whinge. That same Prime Minister has put forward a bill supported only by the big banks, which leaves Australians worse off in retirement and worse off if they get injured at work. Now let's examine this bill a little bit more closely. Schedule 1 will staple fund members to a single fund for life. The government is claiming this will address the issue of unintended multiple accounts. But by not addressing underperformance first, it will mean that three million Australians will be stapled into underperforming funds at exorbitant fees. And who are the, who are the funds with eye-watering fees? Well, fortunately, APRA publishes data on the funds which slug the highest fees. And surprise, surprise, nine of the ten funds with the highest ten, uh, nine of the ten funds with the highest fees are for-profit retail super funds. 
funds like AMP, Suncorp, Aon, Mercer, Colonial First State and Commonwealth Bank. The Prime Minister's old mates who worked so hard to protect from the Royal Commission. These are the sorts of funds that three million Australians will be stapled in if this bill proceeds. Stapling will also be cat catastrophic for workers in high-risk industries who depend upon the insurance they receive through their industry super fund. Workers like 25-year-old Seabus Andrew, who was crushed by two glass plates weighing more than 1.6 tonnes at work and suffered, suffered severe spinal injuries. Thanks to his sea bus insurance, he is recovering with the support of a financial safety net. Under this bill, if Andrew had opened his first super fund with his bank or his hospitality fund, it would be very likely his policy would be explicitly excluded the occupation from coverage. He'd be left with nothing. How is stripping insurance from construction workers, truck drivers and frontline health workers a good policy? How is locking three million Australians into underperforming funds a good policy? Well, Schedule 2 is supposed to be addressing underperforming funds. Let's see how we go here. Well, again, in this principle, this is something Labor does support. But the actual provisions in this bill are woefully and deliberately inadequate. In 2012, the Gillard Labor government introduced the My Super reforms. My super funds are simple, low-cost superannuation products suitable for the vast majority of Australians who do not want to actively manage their super investments. Non-my super products are commonly referred to as choice products. If you read the whole way down to page 27 of Your Future, Your Super Bill, you'll see the entire performance testing schedule only applies to my super funds and some choice funds prescribed by regulation which we now know from the draft regulations will only be trustee directed choice products. That leaves an entire third of super assets, $5.15 billion in exempt choice funds, excluded from performance testing. A $515 billion loophole. Now, it's not an accidental loophole. It's intentionally written to the bill and into the regulations. So you'd ask yourself why. Why has the government excluded a third of the sector from performance testing? And I think I know. Here's a quote from the Productivity Commission's report from its inquiry into superannuation. We found that about 36 per cent of choice products—that's the big retailers—in our sample and about 15 per cent of assets underperformed benchmarks tailored to their own asset allocation in the 13 years to 2017. Almost all were offered by retail funds. Now, this is likely to be a conservative estimate of underperformance in the whole choice segment. Now, the Productivity Commission identified that even by conservative estimates, these exempt choice products consistently underperform. And almost exclusively retail funds offered by financial services companies like the big banks. So, of course, the Prime Minister, who voted against the Royal Commission 26 times, excluded them from performance testing. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Now, here's another quote from the Productivity Commission report. Again, this is the report that the bill is supposed to be implementing. In the choice segment, it reads, poor comparability of products, the charging of fees for no service, the entrenched tale of high fee products, and persistent underperformance by some funds all point to an absence of healthy competition. So we have retail products that persistently underperform, charge high fees, charge fees for no service, and these are the products that the government has chosen to create a loophole for. Now I have an article published in The Guardian today titled Commonwealth Bank reaped superannuation profits even when fund members' balances fell. Now, I'm sure this headline, which brings immense pleasure to the Senator for Financial Services, Senator Bragg, because the article reads, Australia's biggest bank, the Commonwealth, reaped more than $1.4 billion in profits from the superannuation arm Colonial First State over four years 
that include periods when members of the funds it ran saw their balance shrink or stagnate. Now, the only part of the statement that disappoints Senator Bragg, the Prime Minister, is that it was only $1.4 billion. Now, under this bill, when these sorts of funds are exempt from performance testing, it will be easier than ever before for the big banks to milk Australian superannuation accounts dry. And finally, I'll go to Schedule 3. As I said earlier, the government ditched this part of the bill, which explicitly gave the Treasurer the power to kill super fund investments. But as always with this government, the devil is in the detail. You'll see in the bill changes the wording of one of the covenants in Section 52.2c of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. Trustees must perform the trustees' duties and exercise the trustees' powers in the best financial interest of the beneficiaries, including complying with any requirements prescribed by the regulations for the purpose of this paragraph. That gives the Treasurer of the day the power to set seemingly limitless requirements on funds through regulation. That could include what super funds, funds can and can't invest in. Now, I know the member for New England and the member for Hughes were both particularly vocal in opposition to that power. And I'm sure this backdoor to that same power will be of great concern to senators on all sides of this chamber. Now, this bill will staple three million Australians into underperforming funds. This bill will strip vital tailored insurance away from workers in high risk industries. This bill will create a $515 billion loophole for some of the worst performing, highest fee retail choice funds to operate, to operate outside performance intensity. And this bill will create a backdoor for the very investment powers that were supposed to have been axed in the House. Now, it's a bill that contradicts both the Productivity Commission and the Banking Royal Commission and delivers a big payday for the Prime Minister's mates at the big banks, and it must be opposed. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Can I draw your attention to the state of the chamber? Yes. Uh, quorum required. Ring the bells. Senator Sheldon, you'll have to stay and count, be counted as quorum, as part of the quorum.
a quorum present. Senator Ayres. Deputy President, well, here we go again. Uh, another sitting of this parliament uh, where the Liberal Party and the National Party and One Nation one more time are here attacking the retirement incomes of ordinary Australians, attacking no, the probably the single biggest reform to our finance sector uh, and, to the and, and, to the pos and to the potential that ordinary working Australians have to have a decent retirement. Uh, because in this government, in what passes for a government, there is only one set of ideas that bind this mi misanthropic group uh, of characters, uh, and that is to tear down the achievements of previous Labor governments. The Liberal Party can't be trusted on superannuation. They can't be trusted on workers' retirement incomes. They can't be trusted on wages, and as we're discovering, they certainly can't be trusted on the aged pension. The Liberal Party message to working Australians, to families in the suburbs and regions is earn less, retire with less. Earn less, we're going to keep wages down. Retirement, retire with less, we're going to trash the superannuation system. The lowest wage growth, the lowest wage growth on record. The lowest wage growth on record is the achievement of this eight-year-old, tired, sclerotic government. And Senator Van, silly as a two-bob watch down there, can hector and carry on as much as he likes. But everybody, everybody in the country knows. Everybody in the country Sorry, knows. Uh, uh, Senator Ayres, Senator Van, notwithstanding that you're not in your own seat, but do you have reflection on me given by, the, by Senator Ayres, and I think he should retract. Um, Senator Ayres, uh, sorry, I didn't hear a reflection, oh, he, but Senator Ayres, given the time of the evening, perhaps Very happy to withdraw since, since uh, Senator the Van yes. is offended, uh, you will withdraw your comment. What, what he should be offended by is the record well, of this you, government. I, I just did. I thought yeah, I did. Thank chair. you. I, thank you, Senator. Very, very happy to. He's, what he should be offended by is the record of this government: lowest wage growth on record, and no answer, no answer for wages, no answer for superannuation. What has their answer been on low wages? Have they reflected on the institutional factors that have driven wages down? Weaker collective bargaining, an anti-growth fair work commission, no effort from this government to deal with wage theft. Oh no. Have they dealt with the issues that are dragging wages backwards in the labour market? A, a growing guest worker economy, temporary workers being paid nine dollars an hour, particularly rampant in agriculture, as we've discovered over the last few weeks. Oh no. They haven't got a plan to deal with that. The dead hand on wage growth reflected in their own public sector wages cap and the wages caps of public sector government, of, of governments at the state level, Labor and Liberal around the country. Have they got a strategy to deal with that dead hand on wage growth? Absolutely not. The gender wages gap. Crickets. You don't hear a thing from these jokers about dealing with the structural inequalities that mean women in this country and women's occupations are paid less and valued less than men's. We've got no answers from this government in aged care, no answers from this government in disability care, no answers to deal with labour hire and casualisation. Oh no, that's too difficult. The idea that this group, this sclerotic group, eight-year-old government, lost its way tired, out of ideas, could come up with an actual strategy to lift wages. An actual wages policy is a complete anathema to them. Indeed, the previous finance minister said that low wages were a deliberate design feature of their system. 
So what was the only suggestion that these pea-hearted characters on the other side could come up with? These superannuated, overpaid, $250,000 a year, well paid like everybody across this parliament, what could they come up with? That the wage increases of low wage workers should be funded with cuts to legislated superannuation increases. That was the best that they could come up with. Maybe $20 a week if you followed the bouncing ball of their failed logic on their plan, the minister's plan, the plan of many on the back bench who go on with this stuff. $20 a week maybe, $80,000 less a year less for people for their retirement incomes. So ordinary families, for the flawed ideology and failed approach of this government on wages and super, would have paid the penalty in a massive hit in their retirement incomes, uh, and there is no plan for wages. So why would we, why would anyone in the country believe that this government, that anything it says on superannuation could be believed? And then we come to today's performance. An utter shambles, utter chaos, a rabble of misanthropic, misinformed, out of touch, wild ideology driven from your backbench, from a government that is completely out of touch and completely out of time. It's a lazy, tired and out of touch government led by a characterless marketing man who only believes in himself. And what is the product of it? It's another lazy, tired and dishonest, hateful and shallow assault on the retirement incomes of ordinary Australians. What does it mean for ordinary families out there? What does it actually mean for them and their circumstances and their retirement incomes? Well, we know that the government has not got an answer on wages. Wage inequality will continue to grow. Wages, real wages, will continue to fall. They will continue to fall because the best, uh, the best way of assessing future performance is past performance, and these jokers haven't got a plan. And what is the future for people's retirement incomes? Well, you can see it in this shambolic effort at legislating that we've seen over the last couple of months. I mean, bits have fallen off this bill on its way into this place, like one of those broken down old cars you used to see on bush mechanics. Bits and pieces keep falling. Every bump in the road, bits and pieces fall off it. Why? Because there's nothing coherent about this plan except for hating on the industry super schemes. So what does it mean? For ordinary families? Well, it means more risk. It means that you're more likely to be stapled to a low performing fund. It means more risk and uncertainty and investment uncertainty for the superannuation funds and their investment vehicles that have done so well, particularly the industry funds, to mean that more Australians retire with dignity, with the prospect of a decent retirement for them and their families. What does it mean? It means more poverty. It means poverty from lower wages, lower performing funds getting a leg up and lower retirement income. And for many people, particularly those workers in high-risk industries, it means the risk that they are underinsured or incorrectly insured or not insured at all, and that for workers in industries like the building industry, who've who have benefited from the decision of the building unions and the building employers to offer insurance across those industries at low cost, that many people will lose the benefit of an insurance scheme that means that they, when misfortune befalls them or their families, that they end up living in poverty. The last time we saw this approach from the government uh, was in the Industrial Relations Omnibus Bill which became less and less omnibus as we got closer and closer to the vote. Now, there have been some concessions. 
the approach that the government had coming into this, that somehow the Treasurer would have the capacity to override the investment decisions of superannuation funds, that has thankfully fallen off the agenda. But that is an idea that belonged in North Korea, not in Australia. That is an idea that, that should have been the relic of authoritarian governments in other countries, uh, not this government. The idea that in boardrooms and in superannuation funds, investment decisions that have been made could be overruled by a, polit by a politician uh, is an absolute anathema to a functioning, decent market economy and an absolute threat uh, to the security and the future of the superannuation industry. No other industry in Australia would tolerate that level of political interference. Whose, whose idea was it? It's an, it's an orphan, that idea now. But it lived large uh, amongst the coalition for so many months leading up to last week. The stapling mechanism, which will cause up to three million ordinary Australians to be stapled to underperforming funds, funds that don't do well, that drag retirement incomes backwards, where the uh, cost of being in the fund and the returns on the fund mitigate against a decent a decent uh, retirement income for Australians. The impact on insurance, the failure to cover all of the APRA-related entities uh, that exist in superannuation. A third of the superannuation industry is explicitly excluded from what passes for the bill. Flawed performance benchmarks, the administrative burden on funds, which will result on administrative costs being passed on to members through higher fees. And I know on this side, on your side, on the government side of this, higher fees are the way that the retail funds and the big banks return big profits to shareholders and exorbitant executive salaries. But on this side of the House, we stand for the industry fund model that's about low fees, that's about better performance, that's about higher retirement incomes for ordinary Australians. And in truth, what this bill will do is increase the administrative burden on employers. Now, who knows what has been dealt in and what has been dealt out in this sordid legislative performance? I mean, one nation certainly doesn't know, but just like every time, 96 per cent of the time, one nation has signed up for the government's agenda that they couldn't possibly understand and won't be able to explain to Australians tomorrow what it is that they voted for, what is the advantage to ordinary Australians. And for the people, the ordinary working people in the regions and the suburbs of Queensland who they purport to represent, they will not be able to explain tomorrow what on earth it is that they have done, except we know that it's been done for their direct benefit, for their narrow political interests, to suck, to suck up to, to cosy up to the Morrison government. It is a poorly conceived, poorly drafted bill. The Liberals can never be trusted on superannuation and retirement incomes. They have opposed it since the day that it was introduced, bitterly resented it resented it because it meant that people who they never thought should get a decent shake in life got a decent go, a decent retirement income and could retire with a little bit of dignity. They have never understood it and they certainly don't believe in it. Um, there is, I think, uh, a deep loathing in the Liberal Party for industry superannuation and for the collective effort of workers. You know, I was walking past one of the Liberal senators' office that had this old poster of Robert Menzies on the front of the on the front of the office, and it says, "Do you stand for liberalism or socialism?" Well, apart from the fact that Bob Menzies was an old barrister who used to work for the AMWU, my old union, before he came into the parliament, uh, rep represented us in the High Court in some very significant matters. 
and probably would never have taken the approach would never have taken the approach that passes for liberalism on the other side of this chamber on, on these kinds of issues. I tell you what, what is wrong with working Australians through their unions, working together with their employers to build a system that's decent? What's wrong with them making a decision in a pluralist society, in a, in a society where people can get together in their institutions and make a difference to make a superannuation system that is the envy of the modern world. Well, the Liberal Party hates it, and they are going to do everything they can to dismantle it, and it's ordinary people who will suffer from their efforts. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Urquhart. Thank, thank you, you. Um, Deputy, Acting Deputy President. There are a number of points that I think everyone in this chamber would agree that want, we want included in superannuation laws. I'm not sure if my microphone is working at the moment. That probably. Hello. I'm just not sure. Ah, oh, yes, I'm on air now. Thank you. Um, there are a number of points that I think everyone in this chamber would agree that we want included in superannuation laws. That we want laws that test superannuation funds on their performance. We want laws that ensure superannuation funds are spending members' money wisely. We want laws that ensure fewer duplicate funds are created and that ensure superannuation fund members have access to accurate and timely information about the performance of their funds and are able to move to better performing funds with minimum restrictions. These objectives should be quite achievable. Unfortunately, we have before us today a poorly drafted bill that has struggled with these issues. And in many respects, it's failed in these issues. If we all agree that those are sensible objectives, then our job today is, ensure, is to ensure that they are met. Labor is, is the party of superannuation. We introduced it. We have consistently, consistently defended it and consistently improved it. We've done so because it is a core of our labour value something that we treasure, and that is dignity in our retirement. As a result, Australians have $3 trillion in nest eggs for retirement, $3 trillion of economic security to enjoy after decades and decades of hard work, $3 trillion of investment in the economy, and $3 trillion of planning for the future. And as a Morrison government has learned, Labor will not stand by and let this extraordinary achievement be degraded. Labor supports the objectives of this bill. But I've, as I've said, superannuation is a Labor legacy, and we want to see our superannuation system performing well. And so we support the implementation of measures that will prevent members from unintentionally op opening multiple superannuation accounts. We support the implementation of an objective performance benchmark for superannuation funds. We believe profoundly in the fundamental principle that superannuation trustees must always, always act in the best interests of their members, not those of parent entities, shareholders or those in the banking industry. As a result, Labor cannot support the bill in the form that it is being brought forward by the government today. Because the passage of this bill through this chamber as it is drafted would damage the interests of current and future Australian superannuation fund members, working Australians who deserve that dignity in their retirement, working Australians who deserve our respect. So we all have a job of work to do today and for as long as this debate continues. Labor cannot support the bill as drafted, so we will aim to fix it right here in the Senate. And we believe that if we all hold on to those key concepts, dignity in retirement and respect for working Australians and proceeding in the best interests of superannuation, then we might, but we should get there. But if the government can't accept the simple fixes that we propose, then we will protect the interests of Australians workers by voting this poorly drafted bill down. 
So Labor will be moving a series of amendments to fix this bill. We're not here to sink the bill, we're here to fix it. We want an objective performance test and we want to close down issues with multiple accounts. And to be very clear, we cannot support a bill that staples members to underperforming funds for years. Treasury has estimated that 21 out of 77 default my super funds covering 3 million Australians will fail the benchmark on day one. This means that if this bill passes, up to 3 million people will be stapled to a dud fund for life. That is a patently ridiculous and undesirable outcome. And it attests to the repeated pattern we see with this tired government making an announcement, claiming they've done something momentous and claiming to have solved a problem. But in the detail, that's where we find all the flaws, all sorts of consequences that they have failed to consider. You cannot claim that this bill makes an improvement in workers' superannuation when it leaves behind millions of Australians, three million Australians in that case, all announcement, no delivery. Independent modelling has estimated that this measure alone could cost Australians tens of thousands of dollars in retirement savings. And Treasury's own information spelled most of this out for the government, who have simply chosen to ignore it. There are many other problems with this bill. It attacks the basis of insurance in superannuation, the, industri the industrial default system, meaning that workers in high-risk industries will miss out on insurance tailored to their profession. We heard the examples of those professions when Senator Brown spoke earlier in this place. Non-industrially determined funds often include exclusions in their default insurance packages for high-risk occupations. We know, Labor knows that our truck drivers, our construction workers, police officers, firefighters and our health workers deserve better. It really begs the question, why are essential workers' insurance under attack once again? The government has already begrudgedly accepted the necessity of valuable, industrially relevant insurance for workers in high-risk industry through its acceptance of dangerous occupation acceptance to the Putting Members' Interest First package in 2019. We must bear in mind that some workers actually start, choose to stay in two funds, one for access to affordable insurance and one self-managed. And yet they propose these stapling measures. So workers changing into high-risk careers and who do not choose their fund will likely remain in their previous fund, which may well have insurance which is inappropriate for their heightened risk. This bill threatens to undermine the provision of putting members' interest first reforms which relate to those dangerous occupations. Finding insurance as a worker in a high-risk industry is difficult and will, will be made more difficult if this bill passes unamended. Workers who are stapled to a fund that may be the super fund for their first job in hospitality, fast food or retail and do not join their workplace default fund as their work changes, face higher premiums, may be underwritten or may be entirely excluded from insurance cover. The least that we can do, the very least we can do as legislators, is to ensure, ensure that our first responders who are out there every day risking their lives for our safety have the insurance cover that they need and the, the cover that they deserve. Another huge problem is the rush the government is in. It just doesn't seem to be able to get its act together when it comes to timing and implementation of its decisions. This is just like the massive Medicare changes announced by Minister Hunt in late May, giving the health sector just weeks instead of months to change over its entire system to support almost 1,000 changes. And now they want these superannuation changes to take effect from 1 July 2021, this year. That will mean that Australian employers have to scramble to implement new systems in just a couple of weeks. So you've got to ask, why is the rush? There's no answer to that question, except that once again, 
we see a level of fumbling and incompetence with rush changes which have major implications. You could be forgiven for thinking that the Morrison government lives in la-la land, not contemporary Australia. Just like those Medicare changes, here is another example of magical thinking where they completely forgot that the changes don't just mag mag magically happen with a vote in our parliament or ministers Hume and Hunt simply waving their magic wands. There is the practical process of implementation of such significant change to be considered. The bill introduces new administrative burdens on superannuation funds, tying funds up in red tape, which will ultimately paid for, be paid for by superannuation members through increased administration fees. The government's bill also has huge gaps in coverage, as it will only cover default My Super products when the majority of underperforming funds are concentrated in the choice sector. For those many reasons, Labor cannot support the bill as drafted, and, and as I said earlier, we will aim to fix that here in the Senate. And I'll just add a couple of salient points. As most of us who are genuinely engaged on matters of ensuring that working Australians have sufficient retirement savings, no member engagement is critical to ensure that Superfund members are in the scheme that best suited their personal needs and career and life st stages. Super funds have a range of products, including various investment choices. To staple a person to a fund with limited choices may not be in that person's long-term best interest. As you go through life, circumstances change. We know that. What suits an 18-year-old in casual work will not necessarily suit that person when they are maybe a 40-year-old professional. Stapling a super fund member to their first fund is contrary to member engagement as it will encourage a set-and-forget mentality. We want super fund members to take an interest and take responsibility, and much of that is about education. Rather than encouraging set-and-forget, the federal government should be encouraging Australians to take control of their super, including selecting the death, disability and income protection insurance that is most suitable to their individual circumstances and planning for a comfortable retirement. An important aspect of, aspect of taking control is having comparative super fund information readily available. This must be on a consistent basis for retail and profit to member funds, which is not the case at present. There are some actual costs that retail funds are not required to declare at the moment. It would be an undesirable outcome if, as a result of this bill passing the Senate, that millions of Australians are stapled to underperforming funds and untested superannuation products. In its current form, the bill encourages that set-and-forget environment where working Australians don't take that interest in their super, they don't bother checking their balances, they never discover the miracle of compound interest, don't make choices that best suit their situation and the nature of their work. The situation is even more baffling because it espouses the opposite of the liberal ideology of individual choice and self-determination. Is that the Morrison's government is playing some form of game? Do they want people disinterested in and disengaged from their superannuation? Is this about another ideological fed by some kind of elitist view? A paternalistic group of liberal people saying to working Australians, you're not competent. You're not competent to look after your own money, so we should do that for you. I say to the members opposite, is that what this is all about in the long term? Getting your hands on the money, and we know that's been a plan for a very long time. Get your hands on the members' money. I have my suspicions, and I sincerely hope that in our deliberations over this bill that you prove those suspicions wrong and let people take charge of their super without your involvement. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Walsh. Ooh. Senator Ciccone. Chair, I just want to bring your attention to the state of the chamber. Um, quorum, quorum call.
before him present. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Future, Your Super <laughs> Bill 2021. Um, but first, let me say how absolutely shameful this government is. This government has once again shown how pathetically desperate they are to attack super. So desperate that they have resorted tonight to secretive deals to rush through their latest round of attacks. Labor, we will always support improvements to super, but Labor cannot support this bill as it has been put forward by the government today. We cannot support a bill that staples members to underperforming funds. We cannot support a bill that leaves high-risk workers without proper insurance. And we cannot support a bill that gives the government unilateral power to decide what is in the best financial interests of superannuation members. Labor, we have a proud record on superannuation. And it is the vision and determination of successive Labor governments and unions that have delivered what is now a world-class universal superannuation system. And since then, attacks from the other side have continued day after day, year after year in this place, because those people opposite on those benches do not want Australians to be able to retire with their own funds and to retire in dignity. Those opposite simply cannot be trusted when it comes to superannuation. Only Labor will fight for Australians' superannuation. We will always fight for a dignified retirement for all Australians, and we will always fight the attacks on superannuation by those on the other side. Schedule 1 of this bill introduces a new system for stapling members to a single superannuation account. And the first problem with this rushed bill tonight is the government has set a deadline of 1 July 21 for this schedule to begin. This is only two weeks away. This is a rush job, and it's a rush job that will see workers stapled to underperforming funds. Critically, this deadline must be extended. This deadline must be extended to ensure that performance testing of superannuation funds has begun before any stapling begins. If the stapling mechanism commences before performance testing is underway, individuals, as we all know, will be stapled to failing funds. And if this bill comes into effect before this performance test is underway, underperforming funds will be able to keep accepting new members, new members who will also be stapled to these funds potentially for life. Now, Treasury has estimated that 21 out of 77 default my super funds would fail this test on day one. And those 21 funds cover over 3 million Australians. So if this bill is passed tonight in this rush job that the government has put forward tonight without proper amendments from July 1, those 3 million Australians could be stapled to an underperforming fund. 3 million Australians. That is 3 million Australians who could lose thousands of dollars in their retirement savings. 3 million Australians whose futures will, would be worse off because of this government's latest attempts to undermine superannuation. This bill also attacks the basis of insurance in superannuation, the industrial default system. This Senate made really important changes to the Putting Members' Interests First bill to create the dangerous occupation exception. And this allowed funds with tailor-made insurance cover for workers in hazardous occupations to continue providing default opt-out cover for their members regardless of their age. That exception has preserved insurance cover for some of Australia's most at-risk workers. Around 2.7 million Australians work in the most high-risk occupations. Building and construction workers, miners, agricultural workers, health workers, emergency services workers, truck drivers and delivery workers. These are essential workers, the same essential workers that this government has relied upon to help get us through a global pandemic. And how does the government show their thanks to these essential workers? by making a dodgy deal, a dodgy deal to ram through this bill and make the Senate stay up all night to debate it. These workers deserve better.
they deserve better. Whether these workers are up on scaffolding, down a mine or working on the front line of a pandemic, death and total or permanent disability insurance is their safety net. It is their safety net. It protects workers and their families in the worst possible situations. And too many funds have exclusions in their default insurance packages for high-risk occupations. The stapling mechanism proposed by this government could see these workers stapled to funds that do not include default insurance that is appropriate to their high-risk professions. This government would leave those workers and those families without the safety net that they need. Building and construction is the third highest sector for fatalities in the workplace, and each year almost 35,000 workers join the construction workforce, and many start out as young apprentices. But as of today, only seven funds nationwide offer default opt-out cover to under-25s. One of those funds is CBUS, the Construction and Building Union Superannuation Fund. CBUS member Andrew was 23 years old when he was injured at work, crushed by two glass plates weighing in excess of 1.6 tonnes. Andrew sustained serious spinal and pelvic injuries. He was lucky to have even survived. Andrew was hospitalised for over a month, during which time he watched his wife give birth to their first child while he was in a wheelchair. Thankfully, Andrew and his family today are recovering well. His CBUS insurance made an enormous difference to his health and his quality of life. He says that he cannot imagine what could have happened if he and his family had been left without insurance cover. Had Andrew been stapled to any fund except one of the seven funds that use the dangerous occupation exception, he would not have had any cover. This government's bill would have meant that Andrew and his brand new family would have been left without any support. This is shameful. What does this government have to say to people like Andrew? What does this government have to say to families like Andrew's who could have faced incredible financial turmoil, incredible hardship, incredible stress, right at the very time they needed support to get better right at the time that they needed to celebrate the birth of their child. And when CBUS member Shannon was in his early 20s, retirement, it was the last thing on his mind. But the insurance that he received as part of his superannuation is having a profound effect on his life. Shannon is 30 years old and lives in Albury in Victoria with his wife Bianca and their six-year-old daughter. Shannon previously worked in a brickworks factory in a job that he loved. Three years ago, he fell backwards as a result of an anxiety attack and injured his spine. He is now in a wheelchair, and without the insurance that he received from his total and permanent disability claim as part of the insurance on his CBUS policy, Shannon says that he and his family would have lost everything. They would have lost everything. Even though he wasn't injured at work, his CBUS superannuation policy covered him. But insurance policies provided by many other superannuation funds would not have. If Shannon was stapled to another fund, as this bill seeks to do to so many workers, his family would have lost everything. And that is what this government will do to Australia's most high-risk workers. They are risking the futures of Australian workers and families who face losing everything if they get injured and are left without proper insurance. But this government, as we know, has no regard for Australian workers, especially those in high-risk occupations. Our construction workers, truck drivers, emergency services workers, health workers, they all deserve so much better. And this government is not just satisfied with undermining the future savings and safety nets of Australian workers. They've decided that this bill needs to go further. They've decided to try to give themselves unilateral powers to decide what superannuation funds can spend their money on. They've given themselves the extraordinary power to determine what is or isn't in the best financial interests of members. This government is not interested in protecting the best financial interests of superannuation members, because when it comes to superannuation, 
They have never acted in the best financial interests of Australian workers. The only financial interest this government knows how to protect is that of themselves and their mates. We have seen similar powers used in the Northern Australian Infrastructure Fund to block investment in renewable energy jobs in North Queensland. Whose best financial interests was the government protecting then? Whose best financial interests were this government trying to protect when they used their powers to block investments in creating jobs? The only financial interests this government knows how to protect are their own. Questions remain about the way this bill allows the Treasurer to reach into the democratically elected boardrooms of superannuation funds to block investments that he might uh, disagree with. That he might disagree with. Questions remain about the way in which the application of the best financial interest test in this bill, as it currently stands, could actually undermine members' interests. Superannuation is a Labor legacy, and Labor will always protect superannuation. Labor will always support the future of Australians. And that's why Labor will move amendments to this bill. Amendments that provide simple fixes to the serious concerns that we have, fixes that should be supported in this chamber. Labor will always be here to protect and improve superannuation, but we won't support the bill if these issues are not fixed, if our serious concerns are not addressed. Under this government, wages have been stagnant for a long time. Under this government, super has been frozen for a long time. Under this government, Australians have, have faced attack after attack on their super. This time, what they face is a future where they are stapled to underperforming funds that provide them and their family no insurance, no protection, no safety net against the worst case scenario. So there are two things that Australians can always be sure of. The first is that the Liberal and National parties will always find new ways to undermine superannuation. And the second is that Labor will always be here to stop them. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Green. Oh, thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise tonight to talk about uh, these various superannuation bills in front of the chamber. Um, and I do so, I wanted to make contributions um, on these bills and particularly around uh, the impact um, to young people around superannuation and how these changes may or may not benefit them. But the truth is um, young people are becoming more disengaged and disinterested in politics. And I'd like to think that that's not true, but uh, and I think when I started here, I thought there was a way to turn that around. But what we've seen tonight is exactly why young people are disengaged and disinterested in politics. It's stunts and stuff like this, hours motions given to the Senate chamber uh, merely moments before they're due to be debated and considered, hours motions that uh, truncate three separate bills into one debating format so that that debate happens in the middle of the night, um, so that that debate happens uh, when most people are not watching what is going to be discussed. The gallery has gone home. The government wants to push these reforms through in the middle of the night. And that really is the worst type of politics. because. If you believe in your reforms and if you believe that they stack up and if you believe that your legislation should go through all of the phases of scrutiny in this chamber, then you wouldn't be pushing these bills through tonight in this format. Super is vitally important to every Australian. It's vitally important to young Australians. It's vitally important to workers across the country. That's why Labor built superannuation and why we are fighting to protect it. 
It is why we defend superannuation against this government time and time again. And the government can accuse Labor of reading too much into provisions of this bill or drawing a long bow, but the fact is members opposite have been really open and frank about their views on superannuation. They have said that superannuation um, should be voluntary. Uh, they have opposed increases to superannuation contributions. Uh, if given their chance, they would destroy superannuation in the form that Labor built it. And that's why, when there is legislation passed in this place, it is incredibly important for the, the proper scrutiny to occur. And the government is not allowing that to happen in this Senate, and they should be ashamed of that. This bill is fundamentally flawed, and we know many uh, members on this side of the chamber have pointed that out tonight. There's certainly um, a reform required but we need to get that reform right. And we shouldn't be pushing through reform for the sake of a media release, for the sake of a win for the government. We should be pushing forward reform that improves the lives of Australian workers. What we know is that submission after submission to the Senate inquiry uh, on this bill recommended changes to the legislation to fix the problems, to make it work for working people. And uh, you will have read many of the submissions that are available online and the Labor senator's dissenting report, and they identify uh, a number of critical flaws in the bill. Flaws in the bill that haven't been rectified by this government. And so Labor is pursuing amendments in this chamber to fix the flaws in this bill. And I would be more alarmed if I was a member opposite about some of the proposed changes and their impact on superannuation, the things that these changes will do and the things that it says about this government and their uh, idea of transparency and accountability. Because we know that the bill provides an extraordinary power that would allow the Treasurer to personally override any investment decision or payment decision made by a superannuation trustee. Now, why would the Treasurer need such an extraordinary power? Why would the Treasurer need an extraordinary power of that kind? And what sort of investments would the Treasurer use that power for? Well, we can only look to current examples of where ministers have used their powers to stop investment decisions from occurring. The people living in far north Queensland are acutely aware that Minister Pitt used his powers to veto a NAIF loan to a wind farm because he said that it was in opposition to the government's policy in opposition to the government's energy policy to build a wind farm. I mean, for goodness sake, 250 jobs is in opposition to this government's energy policy. Never heard such a thing, but the government stepped in and used its power. And so, of course, alarm bells are ringing about how the Treasurer may use his extraordinary power that this bill is providing tonight. We also know that there are uh, concerns about the implementation of stapling mechanisms, which would cause up to three million Australians to be stapled to underperforming funds. We also know that there are concerns about the impact on the insurance cover that Australian workers would have. It means that Australian workers in certain industries could be left without adequate insurance coverage as a result of the bill. And this might seem not such a big deal to those opposite, but they work in this building. <laughs> they work in their, their offices and their, the CPO, probably, and they don't work in high-risk industries. But in high-risk industries, you need insurance that's specific to your industry because there's industry knowledge that goes along with that insurance product. And it's not just the product itself. It's the people that go out and talk to injured workers. It's the people that, that 
to talk to the families and walk people through making claims and getting back on their feet. That's what these insurance products do. But there's a concern that this could come to an end under this legislation. The bill also explicitly excludes up to one third of all superannuation funds regulated by APRA from performance measurements. So when the government says that this bill is about your super, your future, your super, well, it's not really about all super, is it? Just certain kinds of super. If one third of super is being excluded, it's not really about your super, your future. It's about certain types of superannuation. The government likes to use uh, names of bills to be quite clever and, and cloak what they're actually trying to do. Remember when they called the Ensuring Integrity Bill? Ensuring Integrity, not the Union Killing Bill or the um, Fair Work Amendment Supporting Australians' Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill, even though what that bill actually did was um, reduce the working conditions of casual workers in the mining industry. This government needs to learn that just because you say something in the name of a bill doesn't mean you're fooling workers. And just because you come in here and say the word worker a lot doesn't mean that you're actually helping them. And it doesn't mean that they will believe you. We also know that there is uh, a number of stakeholders have identified flaws in the performance benchmarks originally proposed by the government, including exclusion of administration fees and potential discouragement of investment in Australian assets. Oh, that's what we, we want to deter that, don't we? Investment in Australian assets. I mean, why would the government be, be deterring investment in Australian assets? It's because they haven't thought through these changes or these reforms and they haven't taken on board the very considered submissions and concerns raised by stakeholders. Finally, we also know that the proposed start date of this bill is in a couple of weeks' time. It could have significant impacts on employers who will be required to implement changes to payroll processes in a very short time frame. But the government doesn't seem very concerned about that. They are concerned about pushing this bill through and getting a deal done with Senator Hanson and One Nation. We know that uh, Senator Hanson has uh, circulated some amendments. and. I, I have to say that uh, tax law is not my area of expertise, and so when you have a look at some of these um, amendments, it might be difficult to understand what the point of these amendments really are. But essentially, the government has done a deal to improve the tax concessions of Senator Hanson herself, because the amendments will essentially reduce the tax liability of individuals who are taxed under Division 293. Now, I didn't know what Division 293 was. I don't know about who gets taxed under Division 293, but I had a look. And do you know who gets taxed under Division Senator 293? Green, Senator Green, you're getting very close to an imputation against another member of this place. I would ask you to choose your words very carefully. Well. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm reading no, from the ATO no. website, so I. Senator Green, <laughs> I think it was very clear where you were going. You can continue quoting from the okay, legislation, well, well, but I'm, I would caution you against making an imputation against another member of this place. Well, that please, is not what I'm seeking to please, do. I'm Senator se Green, continue. I am seeking to explain to the Senate, and so that people understand what these what these amendments that have been circulated by Senator Hanson actually do. And when you have a look at who, is, uh, who Division, Division 293 applies to, it is a, a tax on an additional super contributions, which reduces the tax concession for individuals who combine income uh, equals $250,000. So that's what those amendments are about. It's not about helping battlers, as my colleague Senator Watt pointed out. It's not about helping 
uh, the pensioners living in far north Queensland, in Rockhampton, all the way through the Sunshine Coast, these people that Senator Hanson visits and tells them that she will have their back. These amendments are not about that. These amendments are about giving a tax concession to people who earn $250,000 or above. But I started my uh, contribution tonight talking about young people. And when we compare that amendment and what the government is pushing through with this bill, with the three pieces of legislation, and that amendment, which I assume they will support tomorrow because that's how they've managed to get the deal to get this through, well, compared to what young people have been through in the last year, it's absolutely disgraceful. Because when young people needed this government, this government turned its back. This government refused to give JobKeeper to casuals. It refused to give JobKeeper to people who were working in casual work. And you know where most young people were working? In casual employment. So those people had nowhere to go. So what did the government say? Well, you can dip into your own super. You can support yourself. Everyone else at this end of the bracket is doing fine, but when it comes to supporting you, you need to dip into your own super. And what we now know, after the early access scheme was delivered by this government, is that young people who accessed the scheme, of course, spent that money paying off their mortgages, paying off their rent because they didn't have work. They used the money to pay household bills because they couldn't get JobKeeper, but they will be worse off in their superannuation retirement savings because they used the early access scheme. Yes, they managed to not get evicted. Well, that's great because the government didn't do anything else to help them. They had to help themselves. But we know that if an individual withdrew, these, withdrew, withdrew the average figure of early access at their first opportunity, they have forgone already, already $2,420 in returns for market growth already. Forget about what happens when they're 60. An individual who withdrew the maximum amount of $20,000 has already forgone $3,000 of additional savings. That's already because the supermarket has bounced back after COVID so quickly. So when young people need this government, what do they do? They turn them, their back on them. They push through superannuation laws that do nothing to help them restore their super balances. And they do it through an hours motion that means that this, this Senate chamber is not able to debate and discuss this legislation in the way that it should be. And it's no wonder that young people are turning their back on politics when this government is behaving in this sort of way. It's no wonder that young people know that this government will never, ever be there to help them. They will only be there to help themselves. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and I draw your attention to the State of the Senate. Uh, quorum. It's too late. What do I say again? There's been a, there's been I'm not sure I'd get away with that one.
Quorum is present. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I uh, rise, like so many of my colleagues here today, to speak against the Treasury Laws Amendment, uh, Your Future, Your Super Bill 2021. But I do note that this, uh, this piece of legislation is actually being de de debated in the cognate form. So there's a couple of other bits attached to it, just so that they can really, really go beyond the pale in the attack on the retirement of Australians. This bill, as it stands before the Senate right now, is a concerted attempt to at ensuring that the for-profit superannuation funds have systemic advantage over better performing all-profit-to-member industry super funds and completely counteracts the recommendations of the Banking Royal Commission. And as Senator Green has indicated when she spent some time during her contribution explaining the mechanics of the way in which the government is orchestrating this attack on superannuation by the way they're managing the chamber, I want anybody who might be just happen, happen to be watching at this time of night or those who are listening to imagine right now that I am holding one hand above the other in a sign that has become commonly known to Australians through advertising that indicates the sign of a super fund that has members' interest at its heart, that returns the benefit to those members, that returns the benefit to them in their retirement. and That is very, very different from so many of the retail funds who are raking in profits at the expense, at the expense of ordinary, hardworking Australians. Now, what is it with this Morrison government? It's attack after attack, revealing ideological attempts to sabotage Australia's superannuation system. They continually, and I do mean continually, fail to understand the real value of one of Australia's greatest public policy achievements. And instead, they seek to undermine it at every turn. And I, I hear the groans from the other side because they did not understand the concept of universal superannuation for all Australians when Labor established it. They said it couldn't work. It would de destroy the Australian economy. They decried its death before it was even born. The reality is it took Labor vision to establish it. It's taken Labor vision to continue to grow it. And at every turn, this government has resisted it. What we see with this government is a mob who have attacked Labor relentlessly in, at the last elect, election with their lies, lies of a retiree tax, yet they have spent their entire term in government attacking the security, attacking the profitability and attacking the very retirement savings schemes that benefit retirees. They have not let up on their constant attacks on your superannuation. And that's about the only bit of the title of the bill that's right. It's your superannuation because Labor helped build this, established the foundations, looked after it, nurtured it, grew it, supported it. It's your super. It's yours because Labor made it so. But it's this government's attacks on it that will make it their super. That is what they're after. Unless you're a former member of the government, or a big banker, beware, this government is not on your side. Those sitting opposite of me, the Liberal National Party, are too tone deaf to read the room. Despite the global pandemic, an economic meltdown, growing job insecurity and threats to small business and sole traders that have been overwhelming, this government isn't, fi isn't fixated on sorting out those issues. No, they've decided they'll fixate on dismantling, damaging, breaking, eroding, constantly attacking our world-class superannuation scheme. Labor, as has been indicated by many of my colleagues, will be advancing amendments. There are a number of amendments that are being proposed and circulated around the chamber. But let's be clear, the bill as it stands and we are forced to give our second reading responses right now, as it stands, is a disaster for so many Australians who deserve so much better from this government. The Morrison government, it appears, 
has done another little secret deal with One Nation to ram through its controversial super bill. And now, here we are, the Senate forced to sit at these uncivilised hours without adequate time and proper due process to provide the careful consideration necessary to make something decent of this bill as it sits, rather than as it sits before us. This is, in fact, important legislation because it affects every Australian. It's also complex legislation. And if it's passed as it sits here right now, these are seismic changes that are being proposed to Australians' retirement security. Working families, decent, hard-working Australians starting up their small business, operating as sole traders, people working for others, giving the benefit of their labour to the benefit of businesses and this country and their families. They're counting on us here, under the cover of darkness, in a sneaky little move by the government. They're counting on us under the most adverse circumstances to try and fix the government's your future, your super bill. We don't know exactly what the dodgy deal was that was made to trap us all here tonight to have this little game around this piece of legislation instead of following full and due process. But we do know what is at stake if this legislation is passed as it stands. In its current form, this legislation will deliver a situation where millions of Australians will be missing out on a more comfortable retirement. That has got to be a bad thing. As it stands, this legislation will lock workers into dud funds. That is a bad outcome. The legislation as it stands will axe life insurance for hundreds of thousands of Australians who work in dangerous occupations, who couldn't believe, as they you know, went to bed perhaps an hour ago, ready to get up and, and do their day's work tomorrow, who find it hard to believe that their own government would actually construct legislation to take away insurance protections from them and their family. This government has constructed a piece of legislation that we are looking at right now in this chamber that excludes the worst funds from scrutiny. It's hard to believe that they would do that, but that's exactly what they've done. And this bill, as it stands, would allow the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, and future Treasurers to actually take over super investments. That is government interference of a scale that I find completely inexplicable. It's beyond me how anyone who calls themselves a liberal, and I do that mean, in the, mean that in the general sense of the word, enlightened, somebody who's about choice and opportunity, freedom of the individual. How, how could it be that somebody who wants to call themselves a liberal could vote for a bill, could bring into this chamber a bill which contains a provision to enable the Australian Treasurer to take control of Australian people's savings? and to give that treasurer the power to direct the way their savings are invested. Can you believe that that is what this government is attempting to do to its own citizens? What is proposed by those opposite is beyond a joke. And if a Labor government ever, ever had the gall to attempt to introduce something and ram through legislation like this, the, those people opposite would be calling us communists. Josh Frydenberg, when's your next five-year plan for our superannuation industry? The party that famously tried to ban Communist Party now wants to seek powers for itself to directly intervene and manage the private invested fu investment funds of Australians from the office of none other than the treasurer of the country. That's how arrogant this government is. Mr Frydenberg, the only man who can manage your money. Well, I tell you what. He's going to be found wanting if this gets through because he cannot, cannot do what the great trustees of our superannuation funds have done, particularly those from industry super. What is attempted here by this government is entirely uncalled for. It is extreme and it sets a dangerous precedent in Australian society and law. If this bill as it stands were to pass Australians 
hard-working Australians will be stapled to underperforming funds. The Productivity Commission found that a worker will be $660,000 worse off than an identical worker in a high-performing industry fund. That's the gap. That's the gap. If this were to happen, it would render industrial default selection in enterprise agreements inoperable and leave workers far more vulnerable when they move to high-risk industries. That's exactly what happened with a young man by the name of Andrew. 23 years old, out doing a good day's work, he was injured. He was injured and suffered serious spinal and pelvic injuries in that accident. Being a member of an industry super fund, CBUS, the CBUS fund, he was provided with insurance cover. There is every likelihood that Andrew and others like him will be stable to funds that cannot provide the protection that he needs when he moves into an industry such as uh, any construction industry, essentially. So we know that this government is constructing uh, a danger zone for families, for workers, where they are insurance-free. It's hard to think where that family will be if this government gets its way tonight. This bill will make it so much harder for construction workers, for transport workers, for nurses, for police officers and for paramedics who do such remarkable work for our community. This government will make it harder for those very people to find appropriate levels of insurance. And I look to One Nation and I really say to them, are these really the workers that you want to leave worse off? Really? These are the people that you are willing to sacrifice in some sort of deal with the government? They need to remember this tonight, that One Nation stood between Australians and adequate insurance for their families by supporting this piece of legislation, by facilitating its hasty and unseasonal and untimely and inappropriate progress through this parliament. This bill is flawed, and it's because this government has really no real understanding of who the hard-working Australians are. It doesn't know, it doesn't have members on its bench who understand what it's like to go and work two or three jobs to feed your family, because they don't understand the challenges of how much the cost of living has risen in the last eight years under three different prime ministers that they've been in government for. Wages are not growing under this government. Families are under increasing pressure. And now their super won't grow. Schedule 2 in this bill would oblige the regulator to conduct an annual performance benchmarking of the industry super funds, the My Super product. However, whilst the bill outlines the consequences for failing the benchmarks, the yet-to-be-determined regulations do not set out what those benchmarks are. Just trust us, they say. Well, I tell you what, I'm completely over-trusting this government. And this over-reliance on regulation issued by the minister increases the uncertainty for members, for funds and for investment. It's the role of this chamber to scrutinise legislation, not allow that just to the Treasurer to determine at some point in time what the benchmarks should be. That's the worst kind of action this, government, this uh, chamber could allow, to give that power to the government in an un, unobserved way. No worker should be stuck in underperforming super products. Products that persistently underperform should be removed from the, the, the system. This bill should be stricter with the mandated assessments of administration fees in the benchmarks and the period which they should cover uh, should be longer to better reflect the cycle that's necessary for good investment. The schedule should definitely not pass in its current form. The best financial interest duty will require industry super funds to consider the best interests of, of, of members, but the best financial interest duties will not apply to bank-owned profit funds due to their structure. So it's not, it's not, it's not appropriate to have this differentiation. Why does this government 
constantly, constantly attack the superannuation system because it never believed in it now and it's going to continue to, to, to attempt to dismantle things that will break Senator, the lives of good Australian people. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. And can I say, uh, you know, it, it's great to be here tonight to talk about this legislation. I'm not going to lie to you. It's still ultimately lipstick on a pig. There isn't a plastic surgeon in the world that could bring this dead, stinking carcass called superannuation and make it look attractive. I can assure you of that. And I will tell you why. Because superannuation is a lie. If you look at the monthly statistics that come out every month, these are the latest statistics. The median balance for women aged 55 to 64 is $118,000. That's the median balance. After 28 years, so most of these women would have been in the workforce, and, and men, it's 183,000, right? So these people, you know, 55 to 64, have had 30 years of superannuation, albeit the early years were at a lower rate, but that is still less than half to get to the, the cut-off for the, the, the full pension. So long story short, we've got 50 per cent of the people in this country who are still never going to come off the pension, right? So we drop $40 billion a year in lost tax revenue that go to the wealthy, that go to the wealthy, right? It's only the top 20, 10 to 20 per cent of the people who get these uh, taxation concessions. They don't need the incentives. They're already wealthy as it is. 13 million workers in this country, that's 3,000 bucks a pop. 3,000 bucks a pop to, to basically subsidise the wealthy. And then on top of that, you've got another $40 billion in fees shuffling around with all these different rules, stapling and benchmarking and you know, paperwork doing this, paperwork doing that. We become a nation of paper shufflers, and instead of focusing on asset creation, we've now got everyone trading assets and liabilities instead of actually producing goods and services. So that's all gone offshore, and we've just driven up the price of assets through superannuation. I mean, there's that much money in super now. There's three trillion dollars in super. That's more than what stock market's worth. It's 600 billion of it's had to go offshore. 600 billion of it's had to go offshore, and of course, to make these things look better than they really are, there's this bit of a deal going around with all the investment funds in the world that if you invest in another country, you don't have to pay tax. We've got a classic one here, Section 855 of the 97 Act, that basically says if you're a foreigner and you invest in non-real assets, right, you own less than 10% of it, you don't have to pay capital gains tax on it, right? Now that's an, that's to appease. We have inve foreign investment funds invest here, invest here. Uh, you know, our funds vest overshore and they, uh, offshore. They all give each other tax breaks, and, the, and then basically you've got ba base erosion, profit shifting, where all the wealthy fund managers make all the money, pay themselves bonuses because they don't have to pay tax, and the worker is the one who has to pay for it. The worker is the one that has to pay for it. And this is the sad reality: the number of people that are still on the full pension has not moved since 1992. And the number of people on the part pension has reduced from about 28 per cent to 22 per cent, but about 4 per cent of that was when they changed the pension thresholds back in 2017. So all of this paper shuffling, all of these tax concessions achieves nothing. Right now, we could be in here talking about an infrastructure bank and build, you know, doing something around finance and fixing up monetary policy in this country, but no, 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 no. We're talking about the superannuation that only looks after the rivers of gold for both the union funds and the banks. And I just want to be clear about this. You know, I'm agnostic. I was never in favour of superannuation from the get-go. I can remember the August 91 budget when it first came in, because it was my first year of working. And I can remember thinking, why is someone going to take 3 per cent of my income and give it to someone I've never met and they get to manage it? I'd just finished a Bachelor of Commerce the year before, had a hex debt. Right, where I got brainwashed, I had to pay to be brainwashed because you know, I was taught about efficient market hypothesis and that, but that's another story for another day. And then suddenly I'm now told that oh, no, I don't get to manage my own savings, we're going to give it to someone you've never met. And guess what? There's no guarantee you're ever going to get it back. That's what I love about the finance industry, is that if I took my car to a mechanic and you know, had four wheels on it and it came out with two wheels on it, I'd probably have a pretty good, pretty good case to go to the ombudsman and say, listen, I think I've been jipped. But with fund managers, there's no guarantee you're ever going to get your capital back. I mean, they, they, they get a guaranteed uh, fee, and if they do well, they'll pay themselves a bonus. But if you lose the money, then it suddenly becomes a relative thing. Well, we only lost 15%, the market went down 20%. Why don't you let people just put it in their house 
and you know, subject to capital gains tax on housing above $2 million. But let, let's put it in, at least for a lot of people who don't have an active interest in their superannuation, and there's a lot of people, and that's one of the complaints over here about stapling, right? I tell you what they do care about is owning their own house. They get that much, because that's what most people and a common man and a battler do understand are real assets. They don't live in the land of the blowhards. You know, two types of people in this country, there are the battlers and the blowhards. But for Labor to be sitting here complaining about the battlers being shafted, if you're serious about the battlers being shafted, let the battlers keep their own money. Because for most people, it's not 10 per cent of their income, it could be 100 per cent of their disposable income, if, if not more. You know, someone on $50,000, they've got to pay about $6,000, $7,000 in tax. The cost of living is $40,000. Why are we ripping out $4,000 a year in super to give it to someone you know, th these guys don't really care about when they need it now? They need it now just to make ends meet. And if you want to talk about a universal, there is no such thing as universal superannuation. The universal retirement scheme in this country is called the pension. And it's been around for a lot longer than superannuation, and it worked fine. And I'll tell you what, get rid of the $40 billion in tax concessions, and you could take half of that, give it back to the workers so they'd pick up an extra two grand a year, and put the other $20 billion into increasing the pension by, say, 20 or 30 per cent. I mean, the pension for the bottom 72 per cent of the people who you know, income levels, that costs $52 billion. So we give $40 billion in tax concession to the top 10, 20 per cent of people, and we give 52 per cent to the bottom uh, 72 per cent of the people, and they're the ones who need it most. You know, if you want a universal pension that's going to look after stay-at-home mothers, the unemployed, the people on disabilities, you know, why don't we? And, and women. I mean, the whole logic. It's 10 per cent of your income. So if you're on a low income, you only pay a small amount into super. So the benefits for super are much smaller. <coughs> So it is a completely inequitable, completely inequitable scheme. And then I want to go on about this directions power. Now I, I was quoted in the Fino. I, I didn't support the directions power because that would be hypocritical. And the reason why it would be hypocritical for me to support it is that I believe in choice when it comes to and personal responsibility too. I might add, um, and the importance of for people to learn how to save their own money. And there's this idea that people will never get the chance to invest. Uh, if superannuation isn't an option. Well, I'll tell you what, I was saving and had my nose to the grindstone a long time before superannuation was invested. But is it completely hypocritical for Labor to come in here and get all upset because how dare the government tell superannuation funds what to do? Well, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but how dare the government take 10 per cent of people's income without ever asking them and forcing them to give it to someone they've never met? Now, why can't we do what New Zealand did? New Zealand had a referendum on whether or not superannuation should be compulsory. And you know what they voted? They voted against it 92 per cent to 8. 92 per cent to 8. So, as for Senator O'Neill saying that we're not the true Liberals, well, I'll tell you what, I'm a true Liberal because I think that people should have the choice as to whether or not they want to invest in superannuation. It's their money. It's their money. You know, it's not the rivers of gold. It doesn't belong to the union funds or the banks, or the banks. And I, and I must say, I did a, a master's of finance, and you know, I, 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 there was one subject on superannuation. I failed the assignment. Luckily, I still passed the exam because I slagged off superannuation then, and I called out the banks in the 90s because effectively what happened was they lost their deposit base. So CBA had to go and buy Colonial Mutual. NAB had to buy a National Mutual. Westpac went and bought Bankers Trust and ANZ did a joint venture with ING. So they were in clipping the ticket as well with their rivers of gold because you'd have half a million dollars, say 500,000 in a mortgage over here, they'd clip the tickets on that and then they'd have your deposit base over here through super and they'd be clip, uh, ticket and clipping the tickets on that and then they'd have financial planners and all this sort of stuff. Their rate of return when um, CBA, just before they sold it, before they you know, got done over with the Banking Royal Commission, their rate of return on their fund investment division was 66 per cent. I mean, that is an incredible return on equity, uh, and it just goes to show what a racket superannuation is. It is nothing but rivers of gold for the blowhards, banks, unions, whatever. I don't care. But it is time that we crack down on this. It is time we crack down on this. And as for somehow claiming that we're not supporting investment in Australian assets. Well, there's already $600 billion invested offshore. There's already $600 billion invested offshore uh, with superannuation. And I've got the clip 
when Bob Hawke said that superannuation was going to be uh, used to invest in Australian manufacturing. Well, that never happened, did it? And nor would it, because the Button Plan and the Dawkins Plan, buttons, the Button Plan destroyed manufacturing and the Dawkins Plan destroyed higher education, turned our kids into commodities. Uh, everything in this country now is turned into a commodity. There's nothing about you know, personal responsibility and letting the individual control it. No, no, we've got to monetise everything. And it's our kids who have suffered the most, whether it be through childcare or universities, you're, just a, you're treated like a transaction. It's completely wrong. It is completely wrong. But then again, there's a, there's a third side to this that never gets to start dis discussed with superannuation, and it would be, you know, it is the biggest black hole in this country, uh, you know, uh, and that is the $345 billion contingent liability for the non-military defined benefit scheme for Canberra public servants, and that is for 100, uh, 160,000 retired public servants. That works out at $2 million a pop. Now, the top 40,000 of those people, okay, that liability is $137 billion, which works out at $3.5 million per retiree. Now, if you're on more than $75,000 in retirement based as an indexation as your, your final salary, you must have been on a big final salary. Now, can somebody tell me why the, people, the public servants in this country aren't asset tested, means tested on their assets and income? Like the people in the private sector. You want to talk about equality? You want to talk about equality? There was never, and you know, I often get the blame. We can't do anything about it because you know we can't go around breaking contracts. There was never a contract. In order to have a contract, you've got to have an offer, an acceptance, and terms and conditions. There was never an offer by the politicians in this country that they were going to pay themselves on behalf of the uh, retired public servants. They were going to pay themselves a gold-plated pension scheme, and there was, certainly was never an acceptance by the people. And there were certainly never terms and conditions laid out as to just how expensive it's going to be. $345 billion plus the military, which is about $160 billion. I don't want to touch that because these guys potentially put their lives on the line and their families get moved around a lot. You can match that off for the future fund, but that needs to be means tested. And I'll, and I'll mention this to Senator Hume. She brought in this, uh, low, the low $450 thing to make sure that everyone gets an equal break. Well, if you think that low-income earners were getting screwed because they weren't getting $45 extra a month in superannuation, I can tell you we're all being screwed. $345 billion. That works out at about 25 million people. That works out at about 15,000 bucks a pop um, that we're paying each and every one of us uh, for the retired uh, benefit scheme for superannuation. So I say, so I say. You know, we need to bring this lot into it as well, because the bureaucrats are milking us dry, milking us dry as well. Then I'll finish up with a couple of other comments that were made by people on the other side. It was interesting that Senator Green would come in here and she didn't know anything about 293, uh, because if you knew anything about super, you'd know that Section 293 came in as an afterthought, because effectively wealthy people who would normally pay 45 cents in the dollar only pay 15 cents when they con contribute. Uh, in the superannuation. So they save 30 cents up front. And then once their money's in there, they only pay 15 cents on that. But it gets even better. If you make a capital gain, you get a, a third of a discount. You only pay 10 per cent. You only pay 10 per cent on your capital gain. So if you've got assets and things in there, you get a whopping big deduction. But it's interesting because I, I would recommend that Senator Green go away and do a little bit of study about the tax concessions for superannuation. Another, another point of note here is Labor always go that you know, superannuation is going to guarantee, and Senator Watt did it this afternoon, a, a, a decent retirement. It is not going to guarantee a decent retirement for low-income earners. The only thing that can do that is a universal pension that doesn't discriminate on the income that you earned throughout your life. Okay? This pension is paid to you, and it's only means-tested on your income once you retire. And you know, if we want to talk about equality in this country, why should someone who busted their guts, whether they are a cleaner and all these people, I can tell you, the higher up the ladder you go, the easier it gets. It's the people on the low incomes, I'm telling you now, who work the hardest in this country. They'll probably drive further to work every day to get there, back again. You know, if they get a flat tire and they've got to pay 400 bucks for a tire, I'm telling you, that'll hurt their budget a lot. That'll hurt their budget a lot. So, you know, if you want to get serious about protecting the battlers in this country, it is time to kill superannuation stone cold dead. Thank you. Minister, I've 
Uh, I draw the, your attention to the State of the Chamber. Ring the, ring the bells. How many doing? How many doing? Who counts? You or me? Former is present. Stop the bells. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank those senators who have contributed to this debate. With respect to the Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Future, Your Super Bill 2021, I note that Schedule 1 of this bill will prevent the creation of unintended multiple accounts, leading to higher retirement balances for Australians. The Productivity Commission found that structural flaws in the system, which lead to people paying unnecessary fees for holding multiple accounts they do not need, have been resulting in lower retirement balances for millions of people. Schedule 1 will introduce a mechanism to provide the creation of unintended multiple superannuation accounts when employees start a new job. If an employee does not choose a superannuation product when they start a new job, their employer will pay superannuation contributions into an existing account where possible. Default My Super products are available to any member of the public. Now, these products are required to provide death and total and permanent disability insurance cover on an opt-out basis. Now, notwithstanding this, the government understands that a small minority of funds maintain occupational exclusions for My Super products. These exclusions may impact the appropriateness of cover an individual ultimately receives, including as they change occupations over time. And that is why the government has tasked Treasury with undertaking a review of occupational exclusions in default insurance offered by My Super Products, with a view to determining whether such exclusions remain appropriate. Schedule 2 of this bill will require APRA to conduct an annual objective performance test for my super products and other products to be specified in regulations, better holding superannuation funds to account for underperformance. All trustees of products that fail the test will be required to notify members in writing, making sure that they are aware when their superannuation product is underperforming. Where a product has failed the performance test in two consecutive years, the trustee will be prohibited from accepting new members into that fund into that product. APRA may lift the prohibition if circumstances specified in the regulations are satisfied. Now, this stronger consequence will protect Australian workers from entering persistently underperforming funds. Superannuation trustees will also need to take into account the results of the performance test when completing the annual outcomes assessment under the member outcomes legislation introduced by this government. The trustee of a persistently, persistently underperforming product will find it very difficult to show that their product is promoting the financial interests of members. Schedule 2 of the bill will also provide APRA with a resolution planning prudential standard-making power to facilitate a more orderly exit of underperforming funds from the superannuation system. 
This change extends a power APRA already holds in the banking, general insurance and life insurance industries and will help protect members in underperforming funds. Extending this power to superannuation funds will provide new and further protections to members' retirement savings. Now, these powers complement APRA's already strong powers to regulate the superannuation industry where a trustee fails to meet their obligations under superannuation law. And these include an ability to issue a direction to a trustee to consider a merger where appropriate. APRA can also cancel or impose conditions on a trustee's licence to operate a superannuation fund and can revoke a fund's MySuper authorisation. APRA made it clear that it will act decisively where it has concerns about funds that have failed the performance test. APRA will take an escalated supervisory approach within its powers, including a requirement for formal remediation. When necessary, APRA has a broad range of powers to ensure resolution in the best interests of members and encourage orderly responses to underperformance where appropriate. When the government announced the Your Future, Your Super policy in October 2020, we set out on a path for the extension from my super products in the first instance to include trustee-directed products from 1 July 2022 and an intent to expand to other investment options over time. Treasury estimates that the performance test will cover 90 per cent of APRA-regulated accumulation assets from 1 July 2022. Delivering on the intent to further extend the reach of the underperformance test, the government has tasked Treasury with undertaking a consultation process by, July, by the 1st of July 2022 to consider how best to expand the annual performance test to other superannuation products, including non-trustee directed products and retirement phase products. And this will ensure that the performance test continues to have appropriate coverage. Schedule 2 will also enable the regulations to specify metrics for ranking my super products and require these rankings to be published on the government's new interactive Your Super comparison tool. The new comparison tool will provide simple, clear and trusted information to empower members to make their own decision about who manages their retirement savings. Schedule 3 of the bill will prevent, uh, will prevent retirement incomes from being unnecessarily eroded and will restore trust in Australia's mandatory superannuation system. And it does this by amending the existing best interest duty in the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act of 1993, the CIS Act, to specify that this duty requires the trustee to act in the best financial interests of the member. Schedule 3 of the bill implements recommendation 22 of the Productivity Commission's superannuation inquiry, which recommended that the, government, that the government clarify what it means for a trustee to act in members' best interests under the CIS Act. In order to ensure that these new requirements are operating as intended, the government will conduct a review of the changes to the evidential burden of proof and the changes to the, to the record-keeping obligations. Now, this review will be conducted as soon as practicable, three years after the commencement of these provisions. These landmark reforms will ensure that the superannuation system works harder for all Australians by reducing waste, holding underperforming funds to account and strengthening protections around the retirement savings of millions of Australians. With respect to the Treasury Laws Amendment More Flexible Superannuation Bill of 2020, and the Treasury Laws Amendment Self-Managed Superannuation Funds Bill of 2020, I would like to thank those senators who have contributed to this debate, and I commend these bills to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Hume. Pursuant to order adopted earlier today, the Senate will now adjourn until tomorrow morning.